more than just a rocker. Kaiser Guo, a Chinese-American freelance writer and rock musician, co-founded the rock band Tang Dynasty when he came to China in 1989. Later, in 2001, he built up another band known as Spring and Autumn, which was an ethnic-oriented heavy metal rock group. It was also then that he started writing a column for the English-language magazine The Beijinger, a role that lasted 10 years. In 2007, Guo began taking on top communications roles with Ogilvy. Then he joined Baidu in 2010 as senior manager in public communications. Born in the US, Guo arrived in China in his early 20s, which cultivated a deep attachment to the country. In 2010, Kaiser started The Sinica Show, a current affairs podcast based in Beijing that invites prominent Chinese journalists and observers to participate in discussions about Chinese political and economic affairs. After more than two decades in China with his family, Kaiser Guo has become not only an icon in China's rock scene, but also a figure bridging the gap between China and the foreigners trying to make sense of it. Living in China for nearly three decades and experiencing it as a student, a rock musician, a columnist, and eventually a business person, Kai Sokuo should have a clearer picture than most of what China, about what China is about and also it stands for. I talked to him in the live house where he is and his popular heavy metal band held their farewell concert. The more you get to know China, it seems the more receptive you need to be to its apparent contradictions. You know, to, to, to survive here in China for as long as I have, and, and, and anyone who's lived in China for a long time, whether they're Chinese or American, um, I think they, they, they have to, or, 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 or from anywhere else, they need to be able to hold two contradictory truths in their head at the same time. Give me an example. Um, the ones that I always go to are, for, there's just some, some really kind of shallow observations. Chinese are, uh, you can generalize and say Chinese are among the most uh, thrifty and sort of, uh, uh, frugal people in the world, but they're also some of the most status conscious people mm. and, and the most sort of nakedly materialistic in the world. How do these two things jive? Mm. You could uh, you could say Chinese are uh, the people who are most burdened by history, who, who carry the most baggage of history around with them, but at the same time Chinese are, as we, we know very well, the people I've seen who are most capable of sudden and immediate reinvention, turning on a dime and becoming mm. somebody, uh, embracing a future. That's yeah. extremely interesting what you just said, because I was reading the other day your article, trying to use an analogy of Mr. Zhao to right. indicate uh, a Chinese mentality toward its tradition and its history and how it has been over the past uh, few decades. Describe to us. Uh, it was supposed to be a sort of meditation on, on, on soft power. And part of, of, of I mean, I, I kind of use this character who in this little parable was living next door to me, mm. a, a, a Chinese man uh, with no mean accomplishments. He was you know, a very gifted engineer. He had you know, uh, really done great things with his apartment. And, uh, but he, there were a lot of things about him that were impenetrable. And one of them was this relationship he had. I use this as, as a, a fairly on the nose analogy, I suppose, but uh, his wife who he, he was never in the picture, who he talks about sometimes, uh, he, he, she was what, divorced from him or mm. had died or, or something like that, but was always in his mind. Uh, and, and he had a really conflicted relationship with her. Mm. And that's, that's what I was trying to get at, is just that, that le level of conflict. Where you, he, he could- um, What kind of conflicting relationship? So he could speak dismissively about her superstitious beliefs and about her you know, reliance on, on Chinese medicine, but at the same time, you know, would constantly, would, would let no one speak ill of her and would have this, you know, had, had this uh, deeply reverential idea about her and her ideas uh, at the same time. And, mm -hmm. and this is, this is China at the, in, in one breath, you can, you can talk about it as having a, uh, a kind of cultural iconoclasm where it just wants to smash any vestiges of what smacks of old, you know, feudal superstition mm -hmm. about it, its history, but at the same time, it, it it uh, is constantly invoking history, often as a, a defense, uh, because you, know, you don't understand what's happening. You, you, you're constantly wanting to, to explain how the gravitational pull of history makes uh, achieving kind of um, escape velocity from it very, very difficult. You need mm. to burn a lot of fuel just to escape its gravitational field.
you in and off China for quite some time until 1990s, the middle of it. Sure. You permanently, at least for 30 years, 20 years, 20 years, <laughs> 20 years moved to China. What was China then? Was that a cultural shock for you because you were here early 80s, very different. Sure, but I, I was also here in 86, and I spent a year here from 88 to 89, and then I was back here frequently during the, the summers while I was a graduate student from 91 through before I moved here in 96. Mm -hmm. and so uh, I, it, it didn't really shock me. I mean, the biggest change probably was from 81 to 86. Uh, I think that, that the, the light in people's eyes had changed. There was something that would, a, a switch had flipped. It was very clear. What was switch? I think it was it was what you would call sort of a software switch rather than a hardware one. Uh, there was something in the mentality of people. Um, they they had really uh, gone from from pretty uniform isolation and very little knowledge of the outside world to a real thirst, a real curiosity about what was what was happening in the rest of the world. Uh, the the level of curiosity had had really increased markedly, very noticeably, mm. and uh, there, there was a, a new kind of uh, a real enthusiasm and, and also uh, a, a marked sense of ambition that had already set in by then. Mm. And it was clear to me that things were moving in that direction and it would be hard to, to stop that, the momentum had already picked up. What about these periods? Which one or which stage is most significant for you and you think might be most significant for China? Yeah, I think that most people uh, like to point to the period between, say, 2001 and 2008 in that period of, of really rapid change. But for me, I think that the, the really important changes were happening in the 80s. Uh, that's when, like I said, it was sort of, that's uh, what we've seen in, in the period since. A lot of it is hardware. A lot of it is, is you know, the gigantic infrastructure projects and, and you know, all these new gleaming glass towers and the conspicuous wealth that China had accrued since then. The but, hardware. Right, the hardware. The software, though, was the more important part. I mean, the mentality of people, um, and that was something that changed in the 80s. In the 80s, as you remember, I mean, it was a time of, of particular cultural and intellectual ferment. I mean, people were, were talking about really important issues about uh, uh, the identity of, of China, China's eventual place in the world about uh, systems of government, about uh, all sorts of, of, of I mean, there were gigantic debates raging mm -hmm. in, in that time and that was a very exciting time to be here as a college student and as you know, uh, somebody who had recently graduated from college. Some describe it as naivety, others say it is innocence. There are also people who describe it as inspirational that period of time. What would you say? I would say all three are true. I think there was certainly a good touch of, of innocence and naivete. Uh, nothing contemptible about that, nothing at all. I mean, uh, but also, yeah, I think that, that it was uh, also a, a period that was very inspiring. I think that, and, and for those very reasons, I think that, that part of the, the reason that it was so inspiring is that be, because people uh, were so earnestly looking uh, to define a new future for themselves in a, a, a very changed world emerging from a long period of, 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 of virtual isolation from the rest of the world. Whether it's the pride or the dismissal, do you think it is the thoughts that people would have after they study their own history? Or this is a, a pretty much official rhetoric that people picked up through their early years and become part of them? Right. I think that, that it's very easy for people outside of China to overstate the effect of patriotic education or uh, things like that. And there's no question that there's an awful lot of that. Um, you know, I, I see, see my own children, even though they're in an international school, they still, you know, bring home homework assignments and things like that that I, I see contain this stuff. You know, it's in the popular media. You know, you see in, in recent years so many re-airings of old uh, movies about the, the, the Japanese war, uh, recently about Korea, things like this. I mean, the, the history has its instrumental purposes for sure. Uh, whether that, that uh, results in just, you know, sort of a brainwashed or a, a propagandized generation. I don't, I don't believe that it, that, that, that it can be chopped up entirely to that. I think that there's something else that, that uh, you know, comes from uh, the, the way that all of us, no matter where we are, absorb history. It's in the air around us. It's, it's in, 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 in the artifacts that we see. Uh, it's, it's, it emerges in conversations with other people who aren't in a position of sort of pedagogical or political authority. So, it, you know, I, it's both. 
But people would argue whether you have been brainwashed. Yeah, sure. I think there are probably a lot of people who do. Um, and I, I, of course, nobody believes that they've been brainwashed. But I mean, I, I think it would be disingenuous to say that, you know, we escape influence, you know, from, from the, the environment that we're in. Uh, of course, because I have a lot of friends who are Chinese and who, who, who represent to me the Chinese perspectives on a lot of things, my family members and things like that, of course I'm going to absorb a lot of those. But I'd like to think that uh, what, I, what I try to do is not to embody those ideas, but to, mm. to sort of channel them. To, to, I think it's important that people understand how, how Chinese people themselves understand their own historical legacy, and mm. the, how the relationship, the fraught and complex relationship they have with their own history. If you don't understand that, you're missing an awful lot about, about China. And if you just write it off as a result of propaganda and of brainwashing, then you, you're, you're missing a big piece of it. Kaiser, when I was listening to you just now, I suddenly came up with this question. I mean, there are very few people like you who can live in China for such a period of time continuously well, and play so many <laughs> roles and play okay. so many roles inside the society. We observe the changes of the cultures and the society and also play a part in the changes of cultures and the general societies. Are you lonely from time to time? I mean, many of the things you're thinking about, sensing, probably it's very hard to share with most of the others. I wouldn't say I'm ever lonely. Um, I'm frustrated sometimes. I think it's, it's very difficult to do this. Uh, it's a really fine line that you, you want to try to walk. Um, you're trying to inhabit kind of an, uh, two civilizational identities at once and trying to channel uh, the thinking uh, of the one and represent it to the other. And in most cases, it's representing, uh, trying to, to, to help Westerners understand how Chinese people think. And you're, you always run a lot of risks. You, you, you risk looking like you're not just explaining, you're, 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 you yourself hold those ideas. And I do not. In most cases, I do not. I, I, I'm really, but I, I think that what I have developed is a strong sense of empathy. So sometimes it's frustrating in that in that way. You're always going to be regarded with some suspicion. I mean, I, uh, for every time I get called a shill of the Communist Party or, or <laughs> a, a fifty center, I'm also being criticized constantly for being sort of a tool of the, the West, of, of Western imperialism, or whatever. So. Uh, I figure if I'm getting, you know, attacked from both sides, I'm probably doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. But it's not lonely. I think there are a lot of people who, who, who try to do the same thing. I have a, a real strong community of people who I feel very allied with in that, in that regard. Who is Kaiser Kuo? I mean, I'm confused. Even after talking to you, probably even more. Who is Kaiser Kuo? Yeah. He's just this guy. This guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's just this guy, you know. Um, I, I'm, I'm just interested. Uh, I'm a guy who... Uh, I think I, I'm somebody who's been very much defined, uh, certainly in the last 20 years of my life, by one mission, by one calling. I want to be uh, a bridge builder. I wanna, he is, Kaiser is uh, somebody who, who is uh, determined to build bridges of cross-cultural understanding, uh, to help the one side, to empathize better with the other, mm -hmm. and, and ideally in both directions. You have a good box of tools, Kaiser? Not sure. It's, I'm, I'm up to it. Um, I, I have a few tools. Uh, hopefully, they'll, they'll, they'll be up enough for the job. Kaiser Kuo, we're going to miss you. So we're come back you often. I will. I will. <laughs> and we'll see you when I come back. Yes. Thank so you. good to see you. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you.